So today a Soviet clock repair or restoration. I fixed a lot of these, but unfortunately did not document most of these repairs. It has been several years since the last one. So it's definitely Soviet clock restoration time. This is Electronica Soviet clock with this wooden box and this type is 6.15M which I probably didn't show in a video yet. I've shown some different types. There's the backup battery space. With the battery actually still in it, it will probably be rotten. Some switches and control buttons to set it and to set the alarm. Some type number or series number handwritten here. Rotten battery time from 2008. Or that's the expiration actually. Not really that bad. No corrosion. Super nice. And this is from May 89. 45 rebels price. But now let's try to turn it on. Let's have my fire extinguisher ready and let's plug it in. It's making some weird sound. It is very dim, showing zeros. Here's the alarm, the brightness. It's actually dim even at the high. Can I set it? Random numbers. That's not working. I can't set it. And it actually flickers. And very often the display flicker is just in the camera, but here I can see about the same flicker in real life. 60 hours, 91 minutes. That definitely makes sense. So let's try to open it and take a look in it. It could be just a certain electrolytic capacitor. Or high ESR dried out, or it lost its capacitance. But let's open the screws and see. The nice thing about these clocks is that they're fairly simple and they can basically fix virtually any problem they have. I have spare parts for basically any part in it. Just the transformer is a bit tricky, but you can still use a donor. As long as the donor isn't in a better condition than this one, of course. And that's it. This is just a wooden cover with the plexiglass and these screw holes stuck in. Here's the vacuum fluorescent display. Held in place using these plastic bits. And the main board. This is just a single board construction. The board is on four screws here. Of course, slotted screws. What else? Looking at these display terminals, it almost looks like somebody was already changing it. Where are these scratches from a manufacturer? You can see the darkening. The phosphor isn't white anymore, it's greyish. Many, many years of use on it. That's why it's dim. Also the heater, the filament is worn, probably. It's basically a directly heated cathode. But it also could be dim because the supply voltage is lower than it should be. You can see the buttons. Actually, it has pads for the buttons from both sides. This one has the buttons on the back, but the board is universal for the version with the buttons on the front. I also have some in my collection. And these are using the typical circuit with three chips, 16 pins each. And they can come in multiple shapes, but the circuit is very similar. But now, of course, let's remove these screws and see the other side of the board and the transformer under it. And the four screws are out, the board hopefully now comes out. This cable squeezed into this gap. And that's the other side of it. And the transformer here in this box. The buttons and switches, the piezo beeper, some ceramic capacitors, the crystal and this adjustable capacitor to adjust the speed of it. A fine adjustment, some tubular ceramic capacitor, some resistors, a diode. Three more diodes here. Typically the buttons are connected via these diodes. More resistors here. Here's the power supply circuit with some diode, probably just a single half cycle rectification. A zener to regulate about 9 volts for the chips. But the display uses more voltage, about 24, 27 volts. And here's the fuse. Wait, what? Bloody hell, you have to be kidding me. There's a wire across it. I really like these DIY repairs. They're always fun until your house is on fire with you inside of it. Now let's just test the DSR of the electrolytic capacitors, even though I should also investigate why the fuse is bypassed. This big electrolytic capacitor seems to be open circuit, nice. And the small one, 23 ohms, which is horrible even for a small capacitor. There's a table on my ESR meter of typical or worst ESR values for different values of capacitors. 23 ohms is more than anything in this table. The small capacitor is 10 microfarads, 16 volts. And the big one, 50 microfarads, 50 volts. The marking of this one looks like the modern marking, whereas 
This one is still using the Cyrillic marking. 50 microfarads and 50 volts, made in 86. This one made 89. It's nice how most of the Soviet components have some date codes. 88, 89, 89, 86, 88 on this beeper. Now, strangely, the only marking on the crystal is the date code. But it's a typical low frequency crystal, 32,768 Hz. The big capacitor is parallel to the display supply voltage and the small one parallel to the chip voltage. Now let's desolder the capacitors, of course, using this thing. Let's replace 10 microfarads with 10 microfarads. The voltage rating can be higher. They don't even make low capacitances with low voltage ratings anymore. And the closest modern value to 50 micro is 47 micro. Again, the voltage rating a bit higher. A good 10 micro has about 1 ohm ESR. Way better than the old one, 23 ohms. Of course, the lower the better. And a good 47 micro, just 0.25 ohms ESR. Let's just put them in. Of course, electrolytic capacitors are polarized. There is a positive marking on the board. If there's no marking on the board, you have to remember how the old one was in it. And the negative is marked on the modern capacitors using this stripe. The old ones are a plus for the positive one. Of course, a bucket of rosin and a bucket of new solder is absolutely vital. The rosin actually smells of freshly cut trees. Nice. Then, of course, testing time. Let's try to plug it in. And let's see. And it seems better. The beeping is now without the 50 Hz modulation. Low brightness, high brightness. It's actually brighter than it was, even though it's still a bit dim because the display is worn and the studio lights. But definitely brighter than it was before. Now it runs on DC instead of the pulsed single half cycle rectifier AC without the working smoothing capacitor. And it no longer flickers. And it seems to work normally. With the arm setting and the time setting. And now finally I can actually set the time, which wasn't possible before. Of course the chips couldn't work properly before because it was running on a pulsing voltage instead of a DC voltage. Nice! Now of course the question is why the fuse was bypassed in it. Was it drawing an excessive current which blew the fuse? This could happen if the transformer has short turns in it. And then when you bypass the fuse, it will appear to work normally for a while, but with the short turns it draws way more power and after some time the transformer starts smoking and burning. To verify if there are short turns in the transformer, let's stick it in my DIY wattmeter. And these clocks typically draw about 2 watts, so if it draws significantly more than this, there are probably short turns. Let's use the 10 times more sensitive socket and multiply the value by 0.1. And it actually draws 1.84 watts only. This is in the high brightness mode and low brightness a bit less. High brightness again. This seems like a completely normal power consumption for this type of clocks, so I don't think there are short turns in the transformer unless it's shorting intermittently. I left it running for several hours and it seems to keep time well. The transformer isn't burning or anything. Now let's remove this house incinerating jumper. Such a stupid piece of wire can be the difference between having a home and having none. Let's measure the current draw. AC milliamps. 14.3 milliamps. That's really not much. Given that most of these clocks got a 0 0.25 amp fuse, or 250 milliamps, which is about 17 times the actual current draw. I desoldered it, a closer look at it, 0 0.25 amps, made in 88. Is they actually not make fuses with a lower rating. Typically the fuse is about 20, 30, 40 percent more than the actual current draw, not something like 15 or 20 times more. I'm really not sure what blew this fuse. You might be saying the electrolytic capacitor failing actually went open circuit after it shorted, but typically the resistances of the windings are so high that even if you shorted all the secondaries, the primary would not have a high enough induced current in it to blow this fuse. The primary of this transformer is 672 ohms, and the anode secondary is about 42 ohms. This would also limit the current a lot, plus some leakage inductance. This is definitely not the greatest idea, but let's measure the primary current and momentarily short the secondary for the anodes. And the current is 86 milliamps. 
when it's shorted. The induced primary current is basically much lower than the current of the fuse. This demonstrates that a short circuit current on the secondary side is never going to blow this fuse. Let's give it a slow T32 milliamp fuse. The fuse is botched in and it works. And I've already preventively replaced fuses in several of these clocks with a 32 milliamp fuse and in several years it didn't blow. So I really don't know why the original was such a high rating. The new fuse greatly improves the fire safety of it. Let's take a look at the transformer in it. It's quite dirty and dusty. Let's clean it and let's also clean this box. It's just a piece of plastic now. Now it's cleaned and all these stains on it are not actually dirt. These are blemishes in the molding. It's really molded super crudely. But it's actually not using self-tapping screws. It has some metal inserts or nuts molded into the plastic, which is nice. And here's the transformer. It's not made of the typical E and I pieces. It's actually these bent metal bands kept together using this metal strap. I'm checking the heater voltage, the first and last pin of the display. And it's actually 5 volts, as it should be. Very often in these clocks it's excessive and I'm adding a resistor, but here it's actually right. At about 232 volts from mains, despite it's originally for 220 volts. The anode secondary is 30 volts, and this capacitor 29 volts is DC, and the chip capacitor about 9 volts, which should be the same as the Zener. The clock is working, the cover is clean, and, and now of course I have to make a decision whether to change the display or not. I have a lot of new old stock ones, but given that this one is still readable, I will probably keep it in it. It's not really that bad. Surely dimmer than a new one, but still not too dim. It's a vacuum fluorescent display, it inevitably wears out, and the phosphor deteriorates, the emissive flare on the cathodes, but I guess this one might actually still work for a couple of years. And this is under studio lights, normally the room is a little bit less, of course. So let's reassemble it and that's it. And here's the schematic of it. Here the mains comes in 220 volt 50 hertz. Here's the fuse and the transformer. The heater winding 5 volts connected to the heater of the vacuum fluorescent display. And the cathode is directly heated, so it's using the center tap of the filament winding as a cathode connection. Here the anode secondary is single half cycle rectified via this diode. Here's the big electrolytic capacitor, some resistors, the small electrolytic capacitor, the Zener some ceramic capacitor and the battery backup battery connected via a diode. It's a non-rechargeable battery, so thanks to this diode it can only discharge the battery, not charge it. With the crystal, the adjustment capacitor, another capacitor, some resistors. Here's the brightness switch, the alarm enable switch, and the beeper. The display is multiplexed, and this chip also switches the grid is for the four digits. Only one of them can be high at time, pulled up to 9 volts. And the inactive ones are pulled down via these pull down resistors to minus 22 volts. And for the inactive grid is to have some negative bias. The cathode is actually not connected to minus 22 volts, but on this resistive divider is several volts higher. To turn a digit completely off, it actually has to have its grid not just at zero volts, but several volts negative in reference to the cathode. And the buttons are actually sensed in a multiplex, each of them connected to a different grid. And it's using just one input of this chip to sense all of the buttons. This is the main chip, counting the hours, minutes and so on and doing the alarm. Basically comparing the alarm setting to the time. And its outputs are BCD, so before it goes into the 7 segment display, there is a BCD to 7 segment decoder. And there is one oddity, actually several oddities in this circuit. The first one is because the grid is double as the multiplex for the buttons and the low brightness is set by setting a lower duty cycle for the grids, the buttons don't work in a low brightness setting. Not sure this is a design mistake, but it's an intention so that the low brightness setting actually doubles the lock function to lock the buttons so you don't accidentally change the setting. Another oddity is how the functionality is strangely divided between these two chips. This one has the crystal oscillator and several frequency pre-dividers, producing several different frequencies for this chip. Plus this one has the outputs for the grids, yet this one has the outputs for the anodes. And the separate 7 segment decoder actually does make sense, but why these two chips are not just one chip? 
it's odd how this one actually switches the grids. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Yet this one controls the nodes. And the only thing that synchronizes these two chips is the manual reset button, which you sometimes have to press before you set the clock, otherwise the digits and the functions of the buttons are shifted. Even though sometimes you're lucky and they start during the power-up in the same phase. And also the BCD outputs of this one go to zero before they switch to the next digit. And it's using the latches in this decoder to actually hide the zeros. That's why there are five connections, not just four. I also tried to build a Nixie clock with these two chips and this fact made it actually a bit trickier. Typically a Nixie decoder, BCD to one out of ten, doesn't have a built-in latch, so I had to insert an external one here. I still have the breadboard prototype of the clock, but I think this deserves a separate video. Now it's reassembled and this button is to set the minutes, this one to set the hours, this one to see the alarm setting and you keep it pressed and press the minutes or hours buttons to set the alarm. Here's the reset button, the brightness switch and the alarm enable switch. Now the time is 14.25. Let's display the alarm setting. Let's set it to 14.26. Now let's enable the alarm, indicated by the upper dot. And the alarm started. Nice! So that's this clock restored and if you like my videos please consider subscribing, supporting my channel on Patreon or using the thanks button. And big thanks to all of you who already support me. And I also plan to explore this questionable extension with three main sockets and three USB sockets. This one is definitely going to be interesting.